and welcome to Physics 371 Online. What I'd like to do is give a brief overview of material from section 1.3 in the textbook in which the fundamental theorems of vector calculus are presented. Vector integral calculus uh, begins with a reminder that the fundamental theorem of calculus for a one-dimensional function f of x looks like this and basically this is the definition or one way of defining the derivative the geometrical interpretation of this is that when we integrate the derivative of a function over a small increment or interval dx it introduces a change in the function because we're moving from one point in space to another so the function has changed and df dx as we remember from before is the slope of that function so the slope multiplied by the displacement gives us the difference in the function between the beginning point and the end point and the basic format to remember here because this will help us as we construct the fundamental theorems of vector calculus is that the integral of a derivative of a function over an interval is given by the values of the function at the boundaries of the interval and if we look at this fundamental theorem we see that the boundaries of the interval are the points a and b it's very simple for a one-dimensional function f of x the basic point here is that for a simple one-dimensional function f of x there's really only one fundamental theorem because there's only one kind of derivative but in vector calculus as we've seen there are three different kinds of derivatives and each one has its own fundamental theorem note by the way that when we talk about an interval for a one-dimensional function that's a very simple concept but in three dimensions that interval depending on the kind of integral that we're doing can either be a line or an area or a volume so let's look at the fundamental theorem for gradients and applying that reasoning that we just used a minute ago if we have a scalar function t of x y and z then the integral of its derivative this kind of derivative being the gradient dotted into a path vector integrated from a to b along that path is given by the difference in the function between the endpoints and we'll see very great similarity here to the fundamental theorem of calculus for a one-dimensional function the only difference is that in order to generalize this to three dimensions we have a three-dimensional displacement vector dl and then it has to be dotted into the derivative which in this case is the gradient of t. All right, let's just define what we mean in this expression. Uh, a and b are the points in space, the endpoints of the path. The path denotes the path of integration between a and b because you'll see in this expression that path is not uh, specified in any other way. And so we do, in order to evaluate the left-hand side, we would have to define a path and then DL as I mentioned before is the infinitesimal displacement vector along the path the interval in this case is a line or a path and the boundaries of the interval are just the endpoints we want to try to give a geometrical uh, in interpretation of this and uh, uh, basically we've already done that uh, the amount by which the function is changing along a particular direction if you integrate that all along a particular path you get the total change in the function but there's something very profound about this statement because what it's telling us is that the left hand side integrated from A to B along any path gives the same result because the right hand side does not have any uh, bearing on the path the path has no bearing on the value that we get on the right hand side it only depends on the endpoints so this theorem is showing us that this kind of an integral if the function that you're integrating is a gradient then you'll always get a result 
that's independent of the path, and that's very special. All right, the fundamental theorem for divergences. Uh, this in the literature goes by several different names, Gauss's theorem, Green's theorem, and of course just the divergence theorem are all used by various authors for this. And in this case, since we're dealing with a divergence, we have a vector function v. So here, the integral of the divergence of v over a volume of space is equal to the integral of v dot dA over a closed surface in space. Now let's unpack this just a little bit. First of all, d tau is the symbol that Griffiths uses for the infinitesimal volume element. And in Cartesian coordinates, that would simply be dx, dy, dz. dA, as you've probably seen in previous courses, represents the infinitesimal area vector, which, the way we define it, it's always normal to and outward from the surface over which we're doing the integration. Now, uh, let's just look for a moment and ask ourselves, why is this a volume integral on the left-hand side? Because the basic idea is the integral of the derivative of a function over some interval is given by the values of the function at the boundaries of the interval. So why, why a volume element? Well, if you think about what the divergence represents, it's the tendency of the function to flow outward or inward toward a point in space. And so if we want to capture all of that, we need to integrate not along a, a particular direction or over a surface, but over an entire volume surrounding a particular point. That will capture uh, this divergence, the total divergence of the function. And then, having uh, established that we need to integrate over a volume, uh, then the boundary of the volume is a surface, and not just any surface, but as the little circle on the integral sign indicates, it must be the closed surface that defines the volume for this to be consistent. And so, again, as I just mentioned, the interval that we're integrating over is a volume, which specifies the boundary as the closed surface that defines it. And geometrically, we can uh, give a little bit of an approximate kind of definition uh, or an understanding of the two terms in this theorem by thinking about the left-hand side as the amount of this vector function v that's produced or consumed within the volume due to sources or sinks. And, and that must be the reason why we get a non-zero value here, because the, the outflow uh, within this volume is being produced by a source or perhaps being consumed by a sink if this is a negative quantity. And it's a it, you, you can think of it as a, a conservation law of sorts that whatever is being produced uh, within this volume has to either flow outward through the surface or flow inward through the surface uh, if it's being consumed. And so this integral over the surface is a flux. It's the net flux of the vector function v through the closed surface. So I'm not sure how much that helps, but maybe it gives you a, a bit of a idea how to picture the meaning of this theorem. And to the extent that it does that, it can be helpful. Finally, the fundamental theorem for curls. Uh, this goes by the name of Stokes theorem in some textbooks. So which derivative have we not established a function for? It's, it's the curl of v. So here we have the integral of the curl of v dot dA integrated over a surface. That would be equal to the integral of v dot dL over the closed path that bounds the surface. And so why should this necessarily be uh, del dot v, or sorry, del cross v dot dA? Well, v represents, or sorry, the curl of v represents a circulation of v. And by its very nature, uh, that is a, something that takes place in a surface. <coughs> so the integral that we're doing is over a surface, and in order to get the directionality uh, where the dA vector would represent the direction perpendicular to the swirl uh, that's going on, uh, we use a dot product here. And so the interval, to summarize, is a surface, while the boundary of the interval is the closed path that defines the surface, the line that forms the boundary 
of the surface. And the circle again reminds us that it's a closed path. So geometrically, uh, the left hand side represents uh, in this very crude approximate way the total amount of swirl of the function v or circulation of the function v within that surface. And then if v is circulating within a surface, then you would expect there to be some tendency of V to lie along the boundary path that encloses that surface. And so the right hand side uh, does measure the extent to which V lies along the boundary path. If it lies along the boundary path a lot, then V dot DL will be large because V will be perpendicular, I'm sorry, V will be parallel to the DL vector that runs around the path. Uh, if if V does not tend to uh, lie along the boundary path, then this dot product will be very small and perhaps even could be zero. So just to summarize the three theorems, remember uh, this helps me to try to construct these theorems from memory if I'm interested in doing that and I think that's always a good way to practice. Uh, the left hand sides of each of these uh, theorems it contains a derivative the integral of one of the three kinds of derivatives that we've encountered in vector calculus. And the basic formula is the integral of the derivative of a function over some interval is given by or is related to the values of the function at the boundaries of the interval. So on the right hand side we have the values of t at the endpoints of a path. In the uh, divergence theorem we have the values of v on the surface that defines the volume and then for Stokes theorem or uh, the, the fundamental theorem for curls we have the values of v along the closed path that forms the boundary of the surface. So hopefully uh, that will help you remember these things and we will do a little bit of practice uh, in class. That's where I'll see you. Thank you very much.